special speaker to Washington High School. This is a man by the name of Alter Wiener, who experienced the whole Holocaust firsthand. He is, has dedicated the last 10 years of his life going around to different groups, speaking to people about what exactly the Holocaust was, how it affected people, and the profound impact it has had on his life. I think as you listen to Alter, the first time I heard him, which was several years ago, I was amazed that someone who had endured so much could have such a positive appreciation and attitude towards life. And in the years that I've known Alter, I've never seen that positive um, attitude change in any way, shape, or form. So I'm going to let you, him tell you his story, as opposed to my trying to tell you his story. But I want you to understand that today marks his 753rd presentation. Through that time, he has spoken... Through that time, he has spoken probably to well over 500,000 live audiences and has reached well over a million people um, via TV and video. He has also, he, his book, From a Name to a Number, is one of the top 100 books sold by Amazon.com. When you figure they carry about 20 million books to be in the top 100, is pretty amazing. So, I urge you to give Alter your full attention and your respect. When he finishes speaking, he will have a time to answer questions. Afterwards, we have some books that he, is, he brought, that he has signed, that we will be selling to you. And if there's one that you want and you don't have the $20 cost of the book, if you give me your name, I'll save it and you can bring it in and I'll have it for you tomorrow or Monday. So again, a big round of applause, please, for Mr. Alter. Good morning, and thank you for being here. I'm going to share with you my life story. And most of you are about the same age, so you can relate to it. If you look at me, and you look at this picture, you wonder, is it possible that this is the same person? Well, it is. I'm here 18 and a half years old, and my total weight was 80 pounds. When I was liberated by the Russian army, I could embrace my tie with one hand. You try it on yourself, you can imagine what kind of condition I was. In fact, they didn't give you hope to live. They might be dead by now, but I'm here. <laughs> it's not easy to talk about it. Emotionally, physically, I'm 86 years old. I lived in New York for many years, and I didn't talk about it. I realized after a while that most people are not able to comprehend, to believe my own children. But coming to Oregon about 12 years ago, I was approached by the Oregon Holocaust Research Center and they asked me to share my story. I was very hesitant, I have an accent, my English is not perfect, but I gave it a chance. And my first presentation was at Century High School in Grimsborough. A week later, the teacher brought about 100 letters from those students. What did they write to me? Mr. Weiner, you changed my life. You saved my life. You made me appreciate my parents, you made me appreciate my school, my country, my freedom. Then I realized I'm doing something positive, something important. So since then, as mentioned before, that I have shared my story with 753 different audiences and visiting colleges, universities, prisons, and so on and so on. And I received about 46,000 letters and if you read those letters, you'll realize why I'm here. In other words, I'm here not to just share a chapter in history. I'm here, what can you learn from my suffering? That is what I'm here for. It's amazing, if you do, if you do read my book, and you don't have to buy it, you can get it in any library, 
You will see over there on, on page 158, a handwritten letter from an eighth grader that she intended to kill herself on Thursday. She, def she was definite, decided to kill herself. But when she heard my story, she realized how trivial her problems were in comparison to mine at her age. <coughs> you will see over there a letter from a senior in high school that her mother passed away in ovarian cancer, and she happened to be very close to her mother. And when her mother died, she was suicidal. But when she heard my story, that, my <coughs> that I lost 122 members of my extended family, my grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, they all murdered me. I'm the only survivor of my immediate family, then she, said, then she said to herself, oh my God, I'm still lucky. I have a baby, I have grandparents, I have siblings. You, Mr. Wiener, at my age, lost everybody. So you get a complete different perspective. And I can go on and on and on. I go to prison and I talk to lifers and get sentenced for life. But no chance for parole. And they write to me and they change my life. Why? because they realize how good they have it in prison in comparison to the conditions that I was subjected to without committing any offense. So they realize how lucky they are. So I can go on and on and on. I come from a little town, Shamut. You missed something. Can you go to that? Oh. Uh, that is basically the way I looked when I was liberated. What you see in the middle of my head, in that camp, Wallenburg, they used to shave us every few weeks to be recognized in case somebody contemplated to run away. I come from a different town called Chanów in Poland. Very close to Krakow, Paul Paul John II was my neighbor. We come from the same area. As a little kid, I had a pretty good life. Even though I didn't have any of the conveniences that you take for granted today, we did not have. I didn't have it as a young boy. I didn't have an air conditioner, refrigerator, car, TV. It didn't exist. But we did, we did have beautiful values instilled in me as a child. The older I get, the more appreciated I am. Just to give you an idea, I had to go to visit my grandparents every weekend to say hi, to walk a mile and a half. They never gave me a toy or a game. They couldn't afford it, it wasn't available. But it was my responsibility to show them my respect to my grandparents. On New Year's Eve, I had to knock at the door of 24 tenants in our building and wish everybody a happy New Year. This was my responsibility. We had a homeless person at our supper table, sometimes two or three, and we were brought up to respect these homeless people. My father went to see his aging mother every day to be sure that all her needs were met. This is the kind of environment I come from. I went to a public school in the morning, and to a religious school in the afternoon, six days a week. And all this came to an end on September 12, 1939, when the German army invaded Poland. And as you see, the little town that I come from was very close to the German border. So we, we were affected right away. So people tried to flee from the front. How do you flee? In this town of 22,000 population, half Jewish, half Roman Catholic, nobody had a car. I know for a Washingtonian or an Argonian, it's hard to believe or to imagine how could people live without a car. But that is how it was. Nobody had a car. So how do you flee? So people took personal belongings from their back and walked into the interior of Poland hoping that somehow the German will not succeed to take over the entire country of Poland. With 35 million people, a huge country. And those who could afford, they hired the coachman with their horse to walk and try to get away. 
And that is what my father did. He hired somebody. And we did try to get away from the border. When I say we, it is my stepmother. My mother died when I was four years old. I do not remember that. My older brother, myself, and my younger brother. My father couldn't join us in that attempt to get away from the border because the Polish retreating army gave him an order, you stay put because we need the groceries from your business. So he couldn't join us. But we did manage to get away about 40 miles. Took a long, long time because all the roads were clogged with refugees. And eventually, when we arrived to a certain location called Dombrova, the Germans were there already. So we, we basically didn't accomplish anything by our attempt to get away from the border. And as you know, Poland was occupied within a very short time. But we were stuck at that location for three months. We couldn't go back home. There were no means of transportation. Eventually, when we did get back home, we found our apartment rooted, and my father, that we left him behind, wasn't there. Any place we inquired, nobody had an idea what happened to Mr. Wiener. Then they came to us from the Unirat, which was a local committee, and they told my stepmother something which I'll never forget. We know that your husband is missing, but we also know that at the outskirts of our city, there's a pit of victims thrown in by the Germans. If you'd like to know whether your husband is one of those victims, we are going tomorrow morning to open that pit in order to identify those victims. What apparently happened, the Germans picked up at random 38 people in our town, mostly Jews, some Christians, and they shot them. They shut them not to be killed instantly, they shut them to bleed, to suffer until they expired, and then they threw them into a pit, not in a normal fashion, the way you throw in stones. And this happened on September 11, a very infamous day, but this was September 11, 1939. So if somebody is murdered on September 11, and you try to identify the body three months later, very difficult because the bodies are partially decomposed. And in those days, we didn't have DNA. So it took a long, long time to identify those victims. In fact, 10 have never been identified. Anyway, after several hours, my stepmother recognized my father's body by the certain items that he had in his clothing that she was familiar with. She collapsed. And for me, at that point, I was 13 years old. So you can imagine what kind of traumatic experience it was for me at such tender age. In fact, I have nightmares to this very day, just seeing images of my partially decomposed faith of my father. And in my book, I call it the turning point of my life. So eventually, those victims, we took them in caskets to our cemetery in Khshama to give them a proper burial. And we didn't have that earth moving machinery that you see today. It took a long time to prepare a mass grave. And I was standing next to my father's casket for hours, crying, praying, asking him a simple question. Daddy, why did they kill you? I didn't understand at the age of 13, and believe you me, I don't understand at the age of 86, the time today, why did they murder my father? He didn't do anything wrong. I was devastated. Where am I going to go? Who's going to take care of me? Only after the war, the Polish government erected that monument that in the Hebrew language that my father, at number 23. <coughs> and this is the official document that I received 
from the Polish government eight years after the war that my father was murdered on 11 Rzeszeń, which in Polish means September 1939. So obviously life is very, very difficult. And every day the German issue grew order to make our life visible. One of the very first things that they did, this little town became a ghetto, which basically means we were segregated. We couldn't walk in those areas that I knew since my early childhood. Then I couldn't go to school anymore. My formal education ended at the age of 13. I couldn't go to school if I had to like school. Would you like to know when I graduated from high school? I'll tell you. When I came to New York, I had no skills. To make a living, I used to clean toilets. But I wanted to improve myself. So I went to Brooklyn College. I wanted to learn accounting. So they told me to be admitted to college, we need to see a certificate from high school. But they didn't finish high school. I didn't finish elementary school. So they told me, sorry, you cannot be admitted to college. But I wanted to prove myself, so the only option I had was to study by myself, work daytime, study in the evening, submit a test to New York State, and when I passed the test, they gave me that piece of paper which is called an equivalency high school diploma. And with that piece of paper, I was admitted to Brooklyn College, I learned accounting, I became an accountant, and that is how I made a living till I retired at the age of 73. So the point that I want to make, how lucky you are, I hope you do appreciate that you have a chance to graduate at the age of 18, rather than graduate at the age of 35. It reminds me the other day I went to buy a pair of sneakers in Hillsboro and the young lady approached me, she said to me, may I help you? And I said, yes. Then she said, oh my God, I know who you are. You spoke at my school about a year ago. So I told her, I'm glad that you recognized me. But then she said, you know something, my mother would like to hug you and kiss you. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> then, she, then she said, you don't know why. Said, <laughs> then she said, Tell you why, because when you came to our school, this was exactly the time that I intended to quit high school. I was born with high school. But listening to you, I just realized how privileged I am to stay in school. And I was very gratified that I influenced her to stay in school, because I know how difficult life is if you don't have an education. So I couldn't go to school. I had to wear the arm that was the Tower of David. I couldn't walk in certain areas of the city. Life was very, very difficult. But there was no mass murder in 1939, 1940, as it started later on. But in May 1941, in the middle of the night, the journalists knocked at the door of our apartment, and they took my older brother away. Once somebody was deported, there was no contact. He couldn't call, he couldn't write. We had no idea what happened to him. If he was alive, where was he? One year later, in June 1942, the Germans knocked at the door of our apartment. They busted in, they looked at me, they didn't ask my age, and they told me, you have three minutes to get ready. My stepmother pleaded with the German. He's such a young boy, 15 years old. He needs a mother. Have mercy. Don't take him away from me. I love that boy. What did the Germans do? They slapped on her face. You dare to question our action? She fell unconscious. My little brother was clinging to the apron. And they took me away. I never had a chance to say goodbye to my stepmother and to my younger brother. What did the James do with me? 
they put me into a van, like uh, maybe some of you have seen one of the documentaries, like Shinder's Proof and Planets or other movies, and you're familiar with this kind of the car. But believe me, and I don't have reason to exaggerate, I know it's hard to believe. 80 people were pushed into that car, 80 people of different ages. We all had to be standing all the time, there was no room where to sit. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink. One of us did die, he died standing. There was no room where to fall. There are no words in a dictionary to, be, to describe those terrible conditions in those, in those cars. After a day and a half, I arrived to my first slave labor camp called Blechheim in Germany. Upon arrival, I was beaten for no reason. But then something unexpected happened. <clears throat> One of those prisoners in that camp recognized me from my town, told me, do you know that your brother is in this camp? I didn't know. So he took me to meet my brother. I did not recognize my own brother. Not seeing him for one year, he deteriorated to such an extent that I just couldn't recognize him. This is one of the most traumatic experiences in my life that I could not recognize my own brother. Why did he deteriorate to such an extent that I couldn't recognize him? Just to give you an idea the condition in those camps. 24 people of different ages were housed in a very small room, 8 by 10. This is 8 by 10. There were three bunks of beds. It had no mattresses, just straw infested with roaches and mice. They gave us two slices of bread in the morning, and the bread was made out mostly of saw dust. Saw dust. It wouldn't be edible for any person who has more or less a normal life. But we had no choice. <coughs> they never gave us lunch. And in the evening, coming back after a long hard day of hard work, they gave us a soup. Very diluted, lucky you were if you found a floating potato or another vegetable. So obviously people <coughs> were dying on starvation all the time. <coughs> and to die on starvation is a very painful way to die from. I know it because I experienced it. According to my reading, 15 million people, including 4 million Russian prisoners of war, died in those camps on starvation. Why any other day to die from is easier than from starvation because it's very painful. The body eats itself. It takes time, sometimes two or three or even four days. And you still have your conscious. It's very, very painful. So my brother was very pleased that we are going to be together. But on the other hand, he was very concerned. I was four years younger from him. How would I be able to endure those terrible conditions that he already had experienced for one year? At the very first day, marching to where I learned something which is very important. And I, I can see that you are attentive, respectful, I appreciate that. But please, please remember that. I had the impression that because I happened to be a Jewish boy, that I was oppressed. But marching to where? I saw so many different groups. Who were they? Each group had a different badge. Jehovah's Witness, homosexuals, gypsies, Poles. Ukrainians, maybe 30, 40 different groups. They were all marching to the same place of work. What did I learn? Every Jew was a victim, but not every victim was a Jew. Will you please remember that? Every Jew was a victim, but not every victim was a Jew. Is it my personal conviction, not my belief, is Hitler to have won the war? 
You, you and you wouldn't be sitting here in a free society. Hitler had a plan. Folter Deutschland, wo liebe alles. Today, we are Germany. Tomorrow, we shall be everywhere. You don't have blue eyes and dark hair. You are not a pure-blooded German. You are in Syria. I am going to enslave you. And if I feel like, I am going to liberate you. This is very well documented. Read about it. So please remember this. There's one episode that I would like to share with you, which happened to me in the Camp Lachana, just to give you an idea how life was in those days. At the very first week, while I was working, and I still had my clothing from home, and I had my wristwatch, a Paul approached me, and he told me in the Polish language, I see that you have a watch. Give me your watch, I'll give you a look of birds. I was very young, naive, hungry, I gave him the watch. I didn't give it a second thought. In the evening, coming back to our camp, there was a roll call. We all had to assemble at the center of the camp, and the commander said like that, today at the working place, one of you, half bigger or inmates, gave away his watch to a promised local bird. And as you know, this is a crime. If that inmate doesn't step forward and admit his crime, you are all going to be standing here and be for the entire night and go to work tomorrow morning like any other day. <clears throat> As I mentioned at the beginning, I was brought up with certain values, and one of them was that I'm responsible for my own action. I did step forward. That is what I said. I do it gave away my watch for a promised loaf of bread because I am so hungry, and I know that my brother is hungry too. So all the others, about 2,000, were just listening to the bar, and I was taken to a punishment room. They whipped me 15 strokes on my bare body. And two German guards were standing close by to be sure that I get maximum pain and minimum compassion. I have scarred till this very day from that beating. I committed a crime. I gave away my watch for promise over that. Anyway, God's will, miracle, I did survive that ordeal. And when I came out, my older brother was standing there, thanking God that I was still alive. I still had to go to work with all the bruises and cuts and bleeding. They didn't care. I was in that camp only till October 1942, just four months. And then, <coughs> and then the German decided to send me to another camp called Wanda. By doing so, they separated me from my older brother. And from that moment, I had never seen my brother again. After the war, when he didn't show up, I realized that he perished like all the other 123 members of my family. But I had no idea where or when. But something very dramatic happened to me in New York City. There was a gathering several years ago of Holocaust survivors. And somebody approached me, and that is what he told me. You don't know me, but I know you. I was the bookkeeper in your father's business. I remember you as a little child. I have to tell you something that you don't know. I, with my own hand, pushed your brother Samuel into the gas chamber in Auschwitz. This was his job. What the German did, they just fell down sight of the gas, and the people in those gas chambers choked to death. And his job was to push the people into the gas chamber. And he knew my brother from home. So he told me that my brother, my older brother, perished in Auschwitz. You see, this by itself is a very painful experience for us Holocaust survivors to live with. Millions of people never had a funeral. There are no graves. We don't even have an anniversary of their demise. When we had the tragic event on September 11, 2001, watching the World Trade Center towers collapsing, what came to my mind? Are those people who soon the death in are they going to have a funeral, a grave? Apparently, 
over 2,000 have never been identified. So this was said is very painful, especially for me. I come from a culture that I used to visit my biological mother's grave at least five times a year. And today, we don't have that luxury. It reminds me the other day, a student stands up, I think it was in Concordia University, he said, Mr. Wiener, I know exactly what you mean. Because my brother drowned here in Oregon, and his body has never been recovered, and my mother is miserable that she cannot visit her son's grave. So, <coughs> so millions never have a funeral, and they have no grave. This is very, very sad. So the initiative for they sent me to another camp called Granda. This was a very harsh winter, very hard work, building the major highway in Germany, the Autobahn. The commander of that camp was actually famous. He enjoyed torture. After the war, I found out that he was a common criminal before the war. One night he took me and many others, pushing us into a cold bathroom, forcing us to be standing underneath a cold shower for the entire night. People standing underneath a cold shower in a cold bathroom, people died. And he was standing there, entertaining himself, watching us suffering. In the German language, the expression schadenfreude. You enjoy yourself, you entertain yourself by watching others suffer. This is the kind of a person he was. I was in that camp only for two months. But I must tell you something which is very dramatic. And it is not in my book because it happened some months ago. I got a telephone call from Michigan and somebody introduced himself. I am a German teaching German literature in Michigan University. My father was involved in that camp in London. I have been looking for survival. I have been living with guilt feeling my entire life. I have been looking for survivors of the Holocaust. I found one in Australia and one in Canada. And now when I went to the internet, I see that you wrote a book from a name to a number and you are mentioning that came from them. I am calling you to ask you for my forgiveness. He was very emotional on the phone. And I told him, what is there for me to forgive you? Are you responsible for your father? You are not the one who committed those terrible things. Yes, but I have been living with a guilt feeling my entire life. Anyway, after being with him on the phone for about half an hour, I convinced him that I don't hate him, I have nothing against him, because he's not responsible for his father's action. <coughs> that is the way I feel. I have nothing against the German population of, or today, today's generation of Germany. Anyway, he was very pleased that I don't hate him. And since then, we have been in touch. And for me, it is, and I'm pleased that I convinced him that I don't hate him. Because hatred, per se, is very self-destructive. Anyway, from that camp, after two months, I was sent to my third camp called Rosmaster, also in Germany. In all the camps, the conditions like shelter or food or beating, very similar. But there's one episode which happened to me in that camp Rosmaster, which I would like to share with you. And again, I really appreciate the attentiveness of this beautiful audience. But it is so important in my mind. And in those thousands and thousands of letters that I received so far, and you can see it even on the internet, on Amazon, what people write to me about this particular episode that I'm going to share with you. At one point, I went in a factory together with German employees. Most of the time we were separated, but in this particular case, German women, most the women because men were drafted to the army, worked in that part of the factory, operated textile machinery, and we prisoners worked in that part of the factory, dismantling all machines 
and putting up new machines. And there were five all over the factory in the German language addressed to the German employees. Don't give anything to the prisoners. Don't talk to them. Don't make even eye contact with them. And if you do, you are doomed. One day, while I was sitting there in this mentally machine, a middle-aged German woman on the way to the restroom did make eye contact with me. And she hinted to me with her finger like that. I had no idea what she meant. I had a feeling it must be something important. But I had to watch myself that nobody should notice me approaching that indicated spot. Eventually I did find the right moment and what happened? I found underneath a box of a sandwich of two slices of white bread with a piece of cheese. That German woman repeated that noble act of leaving a sandwich for me under that box every day for 30 days as long as I work at that location. Now I have no yardstick to measure to what extent it helped me to survive. This was only for 30 days out of 1,050 days that I was incarcerated. But the question here is, what motivated her? Why was she willing to risk her life not once, but 30 times for a young Jewish boy? She heard on the news, she read in the paper that I am an untermatch, subhuman, and she is a master race, superior. Why was she willing to risk her life? What comes to your mind? I'll tell you what comes to my mind. Maybe she was a son of my age and felt sorry for me. Maybe she was a religious person and she tried to abide by the tenets of her faith. Maybe she wanted to make a point that not all the Germans were so cool. I don't know. I never will. But I'm so grateful for that lady. She's my heroine to the last day of my life. Not just because of the practical health, by rendering to me those sandwiches, she taught me a very important lesson. And I'll tell you why. Three weeks prior to that, a German guard, for no good reason, punched me and knocked out most of my teeth. I have no teeth. He was a German and she was a German. They were both German nationals. But look at this one. One was cruel and the other one was humane. A righteous person. What did I know? That you are going to find good people and bad people in every world. That prejudice or stereotyping is absurd. They were both German. You know, Voltaire said, Voltaire, the 18th century French philosopher said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Anyway, as I said, she's going to be my hero until the last day of my life. After the war, I made an effort to locate her. All I remembered was the location where this happened in 1943. I went to that location. I went to City Hall, pleading with them, help me to locate a woman that risked her life for me 40 times in 1943. What's her name? What's her address? I didn't know. They looked at me to be insane. How can you locate anybody if you don't have a name or others? But that's how I felt. And I am so grateful to that woman for the lesson that I learned from her. And I tried, I tried to convey the same to my audiences, especially to the young people. Just yesterday I got a letter from an eighth grader and that is what the girl writes, Ms. Perina, I promise you that my entire life, my entire life, I shall try to be like that German woman. The other day I went to a prison in Woodburn, in Oregon, 
I spoke to 40 young men. They all murdered. They all were sentenced for life. And I was there for three hours, and I gave them a, cha a chance to express themselves what, to what extent my presentation had an effect on their life. You know what I'm talking about? Mr. Wiener, today you gave me a sandwich. I hope you get the implication. From that camp, I was sent to my fourth camp called Kleppendorf, also in Germany. By that time, the Germans started to move the war. My job was to dig trenches. One day, digging a trench, I came across a raw potato. A farmer pressed a potato on the teeth. I picked up that potato and I ate. Raw, dirty, unpeeled. A new arrival from Belgium observed me eating a raw potato said to me, how in the world can you eat a raw potato? How can you take this humiliation, beating, starvation every day? I just come from Belgium, I had a wife, a child, a good parent, good business. I'm not going to take it. I tried to reason with him. If you would have the experience of two and a half years camp life the way I have, you would be lucky to find a potato. It tasted better than to eat snow. I used to eat snow to survive. You have no idea what starvation means. You might be hungry once in a while. But if you are starving, you will eat anything that you can put your hands on. And he really didn't last long. Another thing which I'll never forget from that camp, while I was digging a trench, a long, long train with human cargo passed by. And I could hear a female voice pleading for butter, which means water. And this was a train with people, men, women, and children, taken directly to killing centers. There were six killing centers in Poland. Auschwitz, Majdanek, Treblinka, where the very young, that they didn't fit for work, and the elderly were sent directly, were sent directly to be killed, not to work. I know for a fact that my stepmother and my younger brother at the age of eight were sent on February 18, 1943, to Auschwitz. And they probably were killed there the same day. So from that camp, Kletter, I was sent to my church camp, and this was my last camp, a real concentration camp called Waldenburg. Upon arrival, I was stripped naked. Everything that I still had from home was taken away from me. And they gave me a uniform consisting of a jacket, trousers, a shirt, no underwear, no socks, an overcoat, a cap, and a number. 64735. They never called me by my name again. Can you imagine to what extent you are dehumanized? You don't have a first name, a last name, just a number. We were so isolated in that camp of Valdenburg that I did not see a female, a child, for eight months. I did not see a meadow or a flower for eight months. I didn't see my own face because there were no mirrors in that camp. When I was liberated for the first time, I looked at the mirror and I wondered who is that person? I know it's hard to believe, but that is how it goes. The uniform that we were given had no pockets. I owned nothing. The only possession that I had was a bowl, a bowl and a spoon for the soap. Nothing else. Nothing else. Picture yourself, you get up in the morning, you don't have a towel, a toothbrush, a toothpaste. The most basic human needs. We were deprived of. I had hands the way you have hands. I couldn't write. There was nothing to write with or to write on. I couldn't shake somebody's hand. Nobody touched me. <clears throat> I didn't touch anybody. The most basic human instinct couldn't be exercised. The only time when I felt a human touch when a guard punched me. I had ears the way you have ears. I couldn't listen to the sound of music. All I could hear was yelling at me, shouting, cursing me, 
and telling me that I am no good, on what basis I'll never understand. I had eyes the way you have eyes. I couldn't read, there was nothing to read. And since there was nothing to read, and we had no radio, we had no idea of what was in the world. So on May the 9th, 1945, we assembled to go to work like any other day. But the German guards that ordinarily escorted us to our working place didn't show up. And we wondered why. We were standing motionless waiting for the German guards. But one of us, a tank of the Russian army, approached our gate and the officer told us, you are free. So at that point we realized that the Germans were indeed defeated. When the, excuse me, when the Russian army saw our machinated bodies, they broke down and they cried like babies. They told us, we are giving you three days of freedom. Go out to the city, kill as many Germans as you want. Take, take revenge, we know how you feel, because we lost 22 million of our own people. I didn't go out to kill. It's not ingrained in me. My father's slogan was hate, hatred, and shun violence. And besides, I could hardly walk. I didn't even know what to do with my freedom. Where do I go? Where do I take money to go? So I continued to stay in that camp, but German families who lived in that vicinity came to our camp, and one of them offered me to stay in her house until I would regain some strength and go back. <coughs> to Poland, and that is what I did. I did stay in her house for a few weeks, and then I went back to look for the German woman, I couldn't locate her, and then I went back to Poland to see who survived of my family. This was the only way to find out. There were no computers in those days, and even the Red, even the Red Cross couldn't provide you with reliable information who survived and who did not survive. So I did go back to Poland and I stayed there for a few weeks and only four cousins of mine did show up and all the others, as I mentioned before, they were all murdered. <coughs> Next. You saw one picture before, how I looked when I was liberated and within a few months I gained 40 pounds. I put on the jacket just as a souvenir. And it shows you what it means if you are not starving. You see here, no girl paid attention to me, but here they changed their mind. <laughs> <coughs> I mentioned before, I don't know if it was mentioned or I didn't mention. Anyway, I got an honorary bachelor degree by one of Pacific College a few years ago. I was very humbled. And I told the audience, this was the commencement, they all became PhDs, and I told them how honored I am. Being in camps, I had two dreams. One dream was to be reunited with my family, which unfortunately did not materialize. And the other dream was that one day I should be able to eat as much bread as I want, just bread, not bread and butter, and to sleep on a mattress. But I never dreamt that one day I'm going to be free in the United States and be honored by such a distinguished audience. I didn't even finish elementary school, and they are all PhDs. So Professor Barber, the president of the college, came to the podium, and that is what he said, Mr. Wiener, I promise you that we PhDs can learn more from your experience that you can learn from all of us. By the same token, I hope that you too can learn something. I never dreamt that I'd be going to be privileged in my life to share my story with such a distinguished audience as you are. Next. I mentioned before <coughs> why, I make, why I'm making an effort to share my story, and most of the time it is because of the responses that I'm getting from 
for my audiences and for those who read my book. This is one reason. The other reason is that there are people who are ignorant about the Holocaust. The other day a teacher asked me to make a copy of the way I looked after the war, of that picture. So I went to Kinkos to make a copy. I didn't know how to operate the copier machine. I asked the young man to help me. He looked at the picture and he looked at me and he said, is this you? You don't look like a criminal. So I told him, I'm not a criminal. I'm a Holocaust survivor. He had no idea what I was talking about. I was shocked. The third reason that I'm here is that there are people who deny the Holocaust. Even prominent people like the President of Iran, Ahmadinejad, said in the United Nations three years ago that the Holocaust is a myth. Does this make sense? How does anybody dare to say it didn't happen? No other event in history is so well documented as World War II. And a leader of a nation of 70 million people dared to say it didn't happen. Let me tell you why I wrote my book. I went to a church and at the end of my presentation an older man approached me and he said to me, I heard your story this morning. I was an officer in the American Army in 1945. I was one of the liberators of Buchenwald, a very infamous camp in Germany. I remember what we found those liberated camps. I have nightmares till this very day. Please put your story in print. Do it for my children and for my grandchildren. That is the only reason that I wrote the book. I have no financial interest in it. But when the book did come out, the first copy, I went to the post office and I sent it to the president of Iran. And since then, every year, I'm sending him letters proving to him with pictures that there was a Holocaust, that it is senseless to deny the Holocaust. And in the last letter, I did something which just hit my mind. I have been getting a check from Germany every month for the last 60 years. I made a copy of the check and I sent it to the president of Iran. And I asked him, if there was no Holocaust, why do I get a check from Germany? Why don't you get a check from Germany? So it is so ridiculous. What do you see here? These are shoes taken away from the children before they are pushed into the gas chamber. This is not a fake. This was taken by an American soldier. How can anybody say it didn't happen? If you remember at the beginning, I mentioned every Jew is a victim, but not every victim of a Jew. This is a German woman, but she happened to have not blue eyes and blonde hair, so they measured her skull to be sure that she's pure, pure, pure Aryan race. Does this make sense? To determine somebody's ability or character based on the color of the hair or the eyes or the skin? Does this make sense? This gives you just an idea, the entire ideology of Hitler's racism and fascism. General Eisenhower, gave an order to the American soldiers. Take pictures of those liberated camps because someday somebody is going to say it didn't happen. And unfortunately, he was so right. What did they find in those camps? Eisenhower, Bradley, Patton. Mounds and mounds of dead bodies. And those who are still walking were have dead. This is not a fake. The Nuremberg trial that lasted 11 months from October 1945 till October 1946, those German officials and military commanders, they didn't deny the Holocaust. All what they did say for their defense was, we had to follow Hitler's orders, but they didn't deny the Holocaust. 
So there are people today who can say it didn't happen. In Babi Yar, in the Ukraine, hundreds of thousands of people were forced to dig their own graves. And then they were shot and buried that alive. This picture was taken by a German soldier why they committed those terrible things. So how can anybody say it didn't happen? In Bergen Belfort, this picture was taken by a British soldier. That is all they found. Thousands and thousands of dead bodies. I sent this picture to the president of Iran. This man in the middle, this picture was taken by an American soldier. This man died one day after the war. Thousands and thousands of Holocaust survivors died soon after the war because they couldn't digest the normal food given to them by the Americans, British and the French. This was a tragic event that the Americans didn't understand. You cannot give a, give a hamburger to somebody who had been deprived of basic nutrients for so long. I would appreciate if you all read it together in unison. Go ahead, please. First, they came for the communists and didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unions, because I wasn't a trade union. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up, because I wasn't a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, there was no one left to speak for me. Thank you. This was written by a German clergyman a few months after the war. But basically, this is the same message, that prejudice doesn't make any sense. This is a German girl, an exchange student here in the United States. She came to interview me where I live in Hillsboro. At the door, she told me, you probably hate me. Why should I hate you? Well, my grandfather was a Nazi, and we in the family know what he did. But why should I hate you? Are you responsible for your grandfather? I don't see it this way. And then I told her, about the German woman who has cried for me 30 times. It took me quite a while to convince her that I don't hate her, because she had been living since early childhood with a good feeling. Anyway, we became very good friends. She's back, she's back in Germany, and she tries to translate my book into the German language. And her parents came last year to the United States, and they came to visit me, and they asked me, her father asked me, do you hate me? So I asked him, when were you were born? They said, 1950. So you were born in 1950, five years after the war. I definitely don't see any logic for me to hate you. And that's basically the way I see it. I went to get some high school the other day, and at the end of my presentation, a senior approached me. She said to me, I heard you, but I didn't see you. Initially, I didn't understand what she meant. But this principal was sitting next to me, whispered in my ear, that girl was legal, legal and blind, so she didn't see you. But then I got an email from her. I don't know how she functions in the school. And in that email, she tells me, you changed my life. Why? I am a Muslim girl, I used to be prejudiced, all kinds of things. But I mentioned in my presentation that under Hitler, any baby that was born with any kind of disability or handicap was murdered by the doctor and by the nurses. 250,000 German babies were murdered by the doctor because Hitler didn't want any sick people. So he gave an order to murder those babies at the infancy. So she realized if she would be born in Germany, a 
the, at the entrance with impaired vision, she would be killed instantly. So she realized how lucky she was being in the United States and the school had a play based on my story. And here she's playing a role of one of the inmates in one of the camps. Carol, where are you? I am I'm ready for questions if you have any questions. But before I go to questions, I would like to tell you one thing about hope. At one point, and you can see it in my book, 1945, in February 1945, I was so weak I couldn't work anymore. So if you couldn't work, they couldn't utilize your strength, they killed something. They liquidated you. And since there was no crematorium in that King Valley book, they sent me to a killing center. I was standing in line, I saw the chimney, I could smell the odor of burning flesh. I knew that my life is coming to an end any minute. While I was standing in line, a German entrepreneur approached me and he shouted at me, come on off now when you can't by the other papier. Get out of that line, young man. You can still work and send me back to work. And a few weeks later, I was liberated. So you never know.
What made me come to the United States? First of all, let me assure you, I'm a legal immigrant. <laughs> 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 I always believe that the United States is the best country in the world, and that if you remember, I mentioned oh four God. cousins of mine did survive, and they settled in the United States, and we wanted to be together, so this is one of the reasons that I registered and waited for eight and a half years for my Polish quota, and I came to this country, and I appreciate every day that I am living in this country. But I am a legal immigrant, so don't be concerned. Yes. Say that again. Do you ever want to go back to Germany? Do you ever want to go back to Germany? Did I ever want to go back to Germany? I didn't go back to Poland or to Germany after the war. The only time I went back to Poland to see if somebody survived was right after the war. But since then, I feel that I'm not ready emotionally or physically to go back to those places. Very, very traumatic memories. I did have a friend in New York that he used to tell me, when I retire, I'll take my wife and my children and go back to Poland and Germany. Eventually, he did retire. He took his wife and the three daughters, went back to Poland, as soon as he stepped into the hotel, he got a heart attack and he dropped dead. So, you wouldn't like me to be dead, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you ever see your stepmother again? No, unfortunately not. And I, I was taken to the camp, if you remember, 1942, and she was taken to Auschwitz in 1943. I, found, I didn't know about this, but I found out after the war the date when she was taken to Auschwitz. But my stepmother is a mother for me, even though she was a stepmother. She could have abandoned me when my father was killed, and she took care of me like her own child. It's interesting you brought it up. I, you know that Sunday was Mother's Day? So I got a telephone call from Montana. Listen to this. And the lady tells me, today is Mother's Day. I had to talk to you. Because the way you describe your stepmother in your book, she should be a mother for all mothers. And the person in Montana didn't know my telephone number, but she was very anxious to tell me that. So she went to the publishing, got my telephone number, and she called me to tell me that the way I describe my stepmother, and she was really, she was my mother. She came to me when I was only four years old. So I don't remember that mention that I don't remember my biological mother. Yes. Have you ever come in contact with anybody from your life before the war? Did you ever come in contact with anyone um, from your life before the war? Anybody in life before the war? After the war, the, those few survivors went to different places, different countries. I have very little contact with those few members who are still alive. And we went together to school. If those who are still alive, either in the United States or in Israel or in Canada, I am in touch with them by far. What's on the newspapers? She wants to know what is on the newspapers. And we'll give you a chance. You can come, come up and look at those if you'd like. We did basically look at what people say about me, not what I have to say, what my story means to them. Again, I wrote that book, I had no idea that I am going to have such an impact on so many people. If I tell you that I have letters from people who intended to kill themselves, 120 letters, of this is something that I could not imagine that just by sharing my story, and my story is a true story, I have no reason to exaggerate. In my book, there's not even one word of fiction. But they get a complete different perspective about my life, about their own life. They start to appreciate more. You know, Plato said 2,400 years ago, an appreciative mind 
is a great man. And our sages said thousands of years ago, who is a wise person? A wise person is the one who learns from his experience. But the wisest person is the one who learns from somebody else's experience. And that is what I see in those letters. You can see them too. They are on the internet all over. I don't know those people. But that is the way they interpret my, whatever I say in my book, or whatever I tell you to a live audience. There is a message here. It is not just a chapter in this story. Yes? How do you remain so full of joy every day? How do you remain so full of joy every day? How do I, I don't have the joy. I try to function as a normal person. That's what I try to do. And it's interesting. <clears throat> I might look to you to be a normal person, but I'm not. I don't pretend to be. Believe you me. And I'll give you a very good example. The other day, this happened right here in Vancouver in the library, in the public library. I spoke there three years ago, and I spoke there a few months ago. A young man approached me, and he said to me, I am not normal either. And I looked at him, and I wondered, why did he say that? He looked to me, a young, healthy man. Well, I came back from Iraq. I was in the American Army, and I lost my wife back over there. But they fixed me an artificial leg. When I walk, people that don't know me personally, they assume that I'm normal. But when I come home to take a shower or to go to bed, I realize that I'm not normal and never would be. Same here. I have physical scars. I take a shower. I see them. I have nightmares, which are terrible. Even though this happened so many years ago, 70 years ago, I, don't, I can't get rid of them. I, I see, like I mentioned before, my, the images how my father's partially composed face look. So I'm not normal. I'm trying to function as a normal person. Believe me, I can go to a wedding or to a party and be jovial, have a happy face, and all of a sudden my face changes. And people that know me ask me, you don't feel good? What happened to you? I'm getting those flashbacks all the time. I'm here now, and a minute later, I'm over there. You know, John McCain, who was running for president, I remember him still saying that. He was a, a, in Vietnam as a prisoner of war for five and a half years. He said once, if you are tortured once, you are tortured for the rest of your life. So that is the way it is. I'm trying to function as a normal person, but I don't pretend to be a normal person. It's almost impossible. The Holocaust lives within me. It's a part of me. It's a part of me. I have everything, everyday reminders. And I always think about my little brother. Who had a heart to murder that little boy? Why? And they didn't murder just them. A million and a half children were murdered. Innocent children. Why? Why? Do you know how many Holocaust survivors there are alive today? About 130,000 in different countries all over. But again, I'm 86 and one of the youngest. And there's one lady, she is in, in England, and was just in a movie about her, it's called, uh, uh, what's her name? Alice Pian, Alice the Pianist? Yeah, anyway, she's 108 years old. So she's the oldest. But again, within the next 10 years, we are all gone. And unfortunately, I hope that people are not going to deny the Holocaust as they are, because there are going to be no survivors. But the books and the movies are going to help. And I hope that my, if you do read my book, and again, you don't have to buy it, it's an available in all the libraries here in Vancouver, you will realize what I mean. Do you find that other Holocaust survivors have the same outlook at life as you do? Do you find that other Holocaust survivors have the same out positive outlook on life that you do? Well, it depends upon the personality, and there are not many Holocaust survivors in this area. When I came from New York to Oregon, 
In, in, in Portland, we met every month, there were about 50 survivors. Now, we are still meeting once a month, but there are very few left. Now, age, they are all aging, and many of them are disabled. So it is not so easy to be in a, in a good mood. And I'm almost sure that we all have nightmares. All Holocaust survivors have nightmares. Maybe some have it more often than others. This is something, as I said, as John McCain said, if you are tortured once, you are tortured for the rest of your life. What I'm trying to do is not to give Hitler another victory. So I'm trying to be, to have a sense of humor as much as I can. And trying to, to survive. He wanted to destroy me. This was his plan. He don't let my, my stepmother to have a grave. What happened? He doesn't have a grave either. Whatever he wanted to accomplish, what did he accomplish? What did Hitler accomplish? Do you know how many Germans were killed in World War II? 11 million Germans were killed. What did he accomplish? You know what the problem with Hitler was? He didn't love anybody. He, was just, he just knew how to hate. He didn't like anybody. He didn't like even the people around him, like Gables, Himmler. They were all, he didn't like them. He didn't know how to love. You know something? His girlfriend, Eva Brown, she complained, she confided to her girlfriend that Hitler didn't know how to make love even. He should have consulted me, but he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another book. <laughs> you can't help but love it. <laughs> <laughs> How did you keep going during the war? What kept me going? There's one thing. There's no clear-cut answer why did I survive. What I do know is that I wanted to survive. I wanted to survive to go back to the kind of environment that I was uprooted from. So I wanted to survive. Some people just gave up. And to give up is very easy. You stop eating and you die. But I didn't. I didn't want to survive. And then I might be just lucky that I'm still here. But there's no pure-cut answer to this question. Why did I survive? I survived, I'm alive, and I appreciate every day that I'm alive. And I still try to catch up those years that I lost. I lost the best years from the age of 15 to the age of 18, my school years. I lost them. So I'm trying to catch up. It reminds me the other day in McMinnville, I put my hand on the shoulder of a female teacher just to draw her attention. So one of the students stands up, he says, Mr. Wiener, you are flirting with my teacher. <laughs> I am flirting with your teacher? How old are you? 18. So look, when I was 18, I was a concentration camp. I couldn't flirt. Let me catch up at one point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever feel any sense of guilt about being one who survived? I don't know if you can call it guilt, but that, that you are right, it's a very good point. I sometimes feel very uncomfortable. And I ask myself, why did I survive and not my brother, the older brother, the younger brother? It's not an easy feeling. But guilt is a maybe too extreme. I mean, it has nothing, nothing to do with me. I mean, it's happy, God's will, that I'm here. I go to a church, they all tell me, God wanted you to survive to share your story. When I go to a book club with women, they tell me, God wanted you to survive to stay with God. <laughs> so we have more. <laughs> yes. Say that again. What happens more often for you? Good memories or bad memories? Unfortunately, nightmares, most of the time, they are very bad memories. In daytime, I try to be a jovial as much as I can. As I said, I try, I answer to that gentleman. I just try to function as a normal person. Is it easy? No. 
But what, what chance do I have? Give Hitler another victory? Not in my mind. Did you have an understanding of why you were in the concentration camps when it was happening? I had questions. That's what it is. I didn't understand it. I just didn't understand it. You know, I had questions about my faith. I didn't give up my faith. But I had questions. I wonder why. Why does God let this happen? You know, Pope Paul John II, when he went to visit Auschwitz, about eight years ago, he said, God, how you could you have kept silent when this went on? I had a lot of questions and I didn't have answers. And I still have questions. Yes. The one in DC? 
How do you feel about the Holocaust Museum in DC and have you visited that? I feel very good about it. I admire it. In fact, when this was built, I wrote a letter to the architect of that museum because it's very good taste and it is very close to be authentic. When I went there three times and you walked in, when I walked in, I felt that I am in camp again. It's very well done. And as you know, it has been only for 12 years in existence and about 28 million people visiting that museum more than all the other museums combined in Washington, D.C. So it is a learning experience. It is a learning experience. And I highly recommend any person who has a chance to see it. Yes. Did you ever think about trying to escape? Did I ever think to try? No. It was in, in all those five camps that I was incarcerated, to the best of my recollection, nobody ever tried, tried to run away. And I'll tell you why, it was very difficult. We were guarded on watchtowers in all those camps. So, where do you run to? You're going to be, this suicide. You'll be caught, you'll be shot. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, The, the Boy in the Red Pyjama. When I saw that movie, I didn't like it. Because in that movie you see a German boy tries to help a Jewish boy behind barbed wire. This couldn't have happened in reality because they would catch you and shot you. So it was almost insane to escape. And then, remember, if one of us would have succeeded to escape, to save his life, all the others would be punished. This was the system, collective punishment. If a German soldier was killed in a village, any village, Poland or Germany, the entire village was wiped out. This was the system. So if you have a conscience, you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to run away, save my life, and jeopardize the life of thousands. So you don't do it. There were very few cases that people tried to escape, and one of them is Sobing Bor, which is a very infamous camp. And unfortunately, all those who did manage to get out from the camp, they were caught, and most of them were shot. May I, if I, if I, if, since you have no more questions, may I ask you one question? Yes, one more. Okay. Go ahead. Before I get on to my question, may I say thank you for coming here and telling us about one of the most He says before he asks you his question, he wants to thank you for coming here and sharing your story about one of the worst times in human history. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comment. Now, if I may ask here. you, oh, I'm sorry. What was, who had the most positive influence on you in your life? Who in your life had the most positive influence on you? My stepmother because she was a stepmother and she was so good. And especially after my father was murdered, she could just have abandoned me. But she did take care of me to the last minute. And I'll never forget when the Germans came to pick me up and the way she pleaded with them. He's such a young boy. He's 15 years old. He is a mother. I love that boy. Don't take him away from me. So they slept on my face. She fell unconscious and they took me away. And again, my mother died when I was young, four years old. So as a mother, she is my mother. Your question. Now, my question was to you, if I may, did you learn anything today? Yes. yes. I want to hear it. Yes. yes. What kinds of things did you learn? Anyone want to share? She said, I asked what they learned, and her answer was, prejudice is meaningless. Yeah, very good. Yes. There's more to life than we really understand. There's more to life than what we're able to really understand. <coughs> yes. There are many different levels of courage. There are many different levels of courage. Very good. Yes. 
We need to appreciate our lives. Very good. Now, one act of kindness can go a long way. Yes. Never take our families for granted. Uh, no matter what you're going through, there's always someone who's going through something even worse. No matter what you're going through, there's always someone who's going through something worse. There's always hope in a dark place. And you remember about that? You remember what I said before about hope? That the, the, young, the teacher said to me, if you come next year. <laughs> <laughs> To be accountable for yourself. Right. Now, if I may, since you didn't think this up, how about personal freedom? It is so precious. Let me give you an example. A new book came out recently, written not by a Holocaust survivor, written by an American professor who did a lot of research, and he's documenting a German soldier wrote a letter to his wife. How are you? How are the kids? I don't think that we are going to win the war. He just expressed his opinion to his wife. I don't think that we are going to win the war. But the censor read this, and he the com and told this to the commander of that unit, and that man who wrote that sentence to his wife was executed. All he did is he expressed his opinion to his wife that Germany might rule the war. But this was interpreted as demoralizing the German army. You cannot say what you want. You couldn't say anything to Germany. You can go out here and say, I hate Obama, I hate Bush. Nothing is going to happen to you. Personal freedom. You can express yourself. It's so precious. If you go today to Iran and you say, I hate Ahmadinejad, you are going to be arrested. Here you have freedom, and this is so precious. Please remember that, to appreciate personal freedom. I don't know, is my time over? If I think my time is over, I would like to thank you very much. You are a wonderful audience, and I can tell you. Check back into third period class just so attendance is taken with your third period teacher. If you wish, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Alter, he'll be here for a while. If you wish to look at the papers, they're here. I will be over here with the books if you want them. And as I said before, if you want to pick one up tomorrow, we can make that happen too. Thank you very much.
Hashem saw a show called Merchant of Venice, one of Shakespeare's shows, and it's in, in it, you know, there's a Jewish man who talks about, you know, how he has the same, you know, how I have the same <coughs> eyes, the same ears, the same hands, so why am I mistreated? And I was talking to my acting teacher about, you know, a couple of generations from now, you know, uh, you know, who may pass away, you know, and this kind of stuff will start to get a little bit forgotten, and I know that I can really take that emotion that you put out and that I felt as an audience member and really put it into a bio or go to do that role in a play or something like that, that I can help betray that actual feeling, that actual emotion. I think that that's really cool and that's something I can take away from this. I definitely want to see it. Yeah, so it was, I don't know what hit home. There was a couple of times where I was like, okay, don't cry. You're going to look like the only guy in the audience is crying, but I wanted to tell you that it was really awesome for you to come and talk to us and that I appreciate it a lot. Oh yeah, definitely, I will. Blessed to be able to see you at my daughter's eighth grade class three years ago. It was just amazing. I asked to go. Um, and again, she told me you were coming here, and I asked to go. I know I missed you at the Rehoboth Church one time. Our friends go there. And I just wanted to thank you. You, you, never, you never had a choice to be a victim. You had a choice of what you did with this. And that was it's so brave. And I know you don't consider yourself a hero, but are the biggest non-hero, and I wish there were so many other non-heroes like you. Again, I don't know if it's I'm going to be big. 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 I'